You're a young man and you're exploring these tunnels and going underground and you spent a little bit of time over there at the uh, Empire Mine site. Yeah, um, and um, the way they brought the ore up, they dropped it into um, ore bins where they uh, had some waste and some mill rock and the waste rock went out on a to the waste dump. And they hired a guy to live down there in one of the houses that he would go out with a hose and uh, hose off the, the rock. And uh, quite often they'd find rock with gold in it that got thrown out. They didn't do a good sorting job. So uh, we would do that too. Uh, just sneak along the, the waste dump and find pieces of quartz with gold in it. But my biggest find was when they sorted the rock and it went to the mill, there was a separate track. They put the ore in a car and they'd run it down to where the stamp mills were. And so we found that track and we were following along one day. And I guess this piece I found fell out of one of the ore cars. They probably had it heaped up. And it was probably the size of a hardball, just chuck full of gold. Yeah, I mean, today it would be worth, you know, several thousand dollars probably. So we, I picked it up and my buddies that were with me, they said, that's gold, that's real gold. You're so lucky to find that. So we ran home with it. We put it out on the concrete sidewalk and beat it up with a hammer. Just broke it all to pieces and said, oh, look, we got gold and kind of threw it away. Never kept a, a piece of it. You don't, you don't have it in the house under the mattress or anything <laughs> and how old were you when this happened i was about 14 13 14 years old yeah but one of the neat pieces i did keep was my father having the store the miners would come in and some of the miners weren't too honest they were called high graders and a high grader is nothing more than a thief it steals from the company so they would bring in samples of of rock in a in a ore bag and my dad would take this and he would make a call to a guy named Nick in Nevada City and Nick had an old Model A coupe he'd come over and they'd talk a while and they'd pass my dad would pass this bag of high grade to the to Nick and a week later Nick would come back and give my dad some money and then a few days later the miner who had I graded that would come back and my dad would pay him. So I didn't realize what was going on at that age, probably 13 years old. The one day this miner dropped off a bag of high grade and my dad says, well, Nick's gone for a while, so we can't work this up or get this taken care of for you, he said. So, but he said, my son's been interested in how to pan for gold and how to crush up rock. And we did have a little mortar and pestle. So I went out in the back room and took this bag of ore and my neighbor boy that helped me too, we panned it all out. And we got uh, about two and a half ounces out of this bag of ore. Well, I happened to keep one of two pieces out of it and I still have those pieces. So the, the, the big joke about when we're doing charter schools and talking, about gold is that I high graded from the high grader, so <laughs> it's kind of kind of fun to think about, and so that's really the only uh, highlight from the from gold, except for the one kid I ran around with. His dad was a driller, so the driller got to be the one underground drilling, and then the next day he'd go back, and they'd muck out, and he'd be able to see some of the the gold and the rock and he came in with fantastic stories of massive amounts of gold that they found in the rock. And then he said in the later years, in 1955, 56, they'd make discoveries. They were doing mostly exploration work. And the story was that they would find a good vein that's producing well, and they would go in with cement, and they would c cement it off and record on there the values that were in that vein and never did mine it. So that leads us to believe that if that's really true story, that 
there's a lot of gold still underground that, that never was mined out. You know, if you could uh, elaborate a bit on a high grader, what would be his likely position in the mine and how exactly would he get that home? Yeah, yeah that's always an interesting topic. And even Jack Clark, who was a superintendent at Idaho, Maryland, we talked about it quite often when I meet with him. I said, there should be a book written about high graders. And he just kind of passes the subject off. He didn't want to talk about it because I guess he was in a position there that, that even today he's been probably retired, you know, 50 years from him, but he just he avoids the conversation. But the miners had different ways. Uh, they had change rooms where they had to change their dirty clothes into clean clothes, and, and supposedly they, they had to walk in front of uh, a superintendent or someone there without their clothes on, and they checked all their... their uh, lunch pails, because they'd always take their lunch pail with them to go underground for eating. But somehow or another, they had ways to get that out. If it weren't, if they didn't carry it out, they knew somebody, a hoist man, or somebody that was dealing with the animals down there. And they would give them a percentage of it uh, if they could get it to the surface. And uh, so they had ways, I don't know. I. I wish we could get some old timers and really document it uh, thoroughly to see how they did it. Well, in an area that has gold mining or a lot of money changing hands, there's always going to be people to exploit that. There's going to be some nefarious characters come up to Nevada County. Um, I imagine there are ladies of the night that uh, frequented the area. Um, so you high graded from the high graders. That's a <laughs> that's a great story. Was it common for miners to pay their tab in gold? No, 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 no. They never. I never saw any uh, gold exchange uh, uh, to my dad. And uh, no, they usually paid in cash when payday came around because they didn't make more than probably three to five dollars a day in the, in the in that time in the fifties. So. Was that enough to sustain a family of two or three? Sure, sure. It was enough to sustain them. Yeah, you know, you, know, you got to figure that, you know, the cost of goods was way down at that time, too. I, I want to go back a little bit about my career. I was a mechanic for the Forest Service. I did not do a hands-on firefighting at all. I went to many, many fires, slept out on the ground and in my truck and all, maintaining fire equipment. And then... Levita was able to get a job as a forest supervisor secretary for the Tahoe National Forest. And then she became uh, what is called the information officer on a lot of the fires and and uh, would go out and sometimes even fly over the fires and, and uh, get the information put together for the for the papers and and uh, television. Television, yeah. So that just gets us back to the what our careers were. Mm -hmm. And then with my mechanical abilities, like I said before, it was mainly a God-given gift that I uh, pursued the kind of work I do. And then I just loved the machinery and the massive machinery that was used in mining and how it was used. And so I studied that just through books and, mm. and uh, observed, went to many museums observing how People would put things together, or even active mines that we explored. We, at one time, went all the way across to Nova Scotia and stopped at almost every mine we could mm -hmm. in museum to learn how they process their ores and stuff. And so my first collecting was probably around 1951, 52. And I just happened to be in an area called Poker Flat. And uh, we eventually got a, a mining claim there. And so when you're mining, you're always picking up artifacts that would have been left over by the miners. And so we started with a small collection of nuts and bolts and hooks and uh, uh, drills, square nails. square nails, and all those kinds of things. And, and then what's not till the last 25 years, they get serious about collecting larger items and, and then acquiring 
large items that maybe I couldn't use, but the city here can use. And we displayed them all around town now. And then I volunteer at the North Star Mine Museum and help them in different displays. And, and uh, the Empire Mine has asked me several times to be involved with them in making uh, working displays and stuff. But I never could get along with the way their politics were and, and how they, the IMPA organization wanted to do things. So it never did develop into anything there. I did sell them one of my mining displays. I had a mobile unit on a trailer. So it's up there now at the park. And, um, <clears throat> Poker Flat, you had a mining claim. Was that for dredging or panning or both? Boker Flat was a very unusual area, and then we went in. Where exactly is it? Boker Flat is 17 miles north of Downeyville on Canyon Creek. Oh, yes. um, <clears throat> but we went, I went in there in 1961 with just a wetsuit and a, a mask and sniping tools, where the sniping tools are just little crevicing tools and little suction bulbs. and and uh, scanned the bedrock and we picked up some real nice nugget gold. Prior to that I had explored the, the Deer Creek and the American River drainages just because I like uh, exploring and trying to, to find gold and so then we got into Poker Flat we started finding nugget gold and I thought well this is what it's all about and mm -hmm. so we got more serious and acquired a claim in there and developed into oh, 120 acres of property that we had for 38 years and uh, mined there with a suction dredge, five inch suction dredge. Okay, you're there in Poker Flat with your family uh, and you're finding some nuggets. What did you do with this stuff? Mm -hmm. yeah, each of the boys had their own gold bottle and uh, I think, I don't know, I think they've taken them all to the, back to their home now, but uh, they have their own special nuggets and special bottle they'd hold their nuggets in. But it got to be very profitable. We made several ounces a season, so what do you do with it rather than put it in a, in a safe or in a bottle? And so I started making jewelry since I I was, uh, I had the abilities. I taught myself how to weld, how to gold solder. And so I thought, well, this is something that I could sell. And you could usually get three times the amount of the value in a jewelry piece that you could as a natural gold nugget. So I would, I let word out, I started making this stuff. And actually, I had a dental uh, bill one time where I took a bunch of the gold in pendants and stuff and traded for my, my uh, dental work. And there was, a, there was a lab technician that came in while we were doing trading and he took some too. Uh, uh, but it became pretty profitable, and I made the pieces. Got word. I never did advertise anything at all. It just kind of went out word of mouth. So one particular time, some people wanted to look at my stuff, and we made an appointment at McDonald's in Grass Valley. And went in there and got a table off to the corner and laid out all my, my nuggets on the table, and they bought several several pieces from me. And uh, But I've traded. A lot of the gold I traded for a tractor, traded for a truck. Mm. I traded for a Pelton wheel. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes you find items you want to buy, an artifact, and people won't sell it. And I say, well, would you trade for some gold? Back in the 80s, he said, I'm mining up in the out of Fairbanks. Would you like to come up and mine with me? And I said, I can't because I have a Forest Service civil service job I can't just leave my job and go and so he showed me pictures of the gold they were finding and the process they were doing and it intrigued me so much that I begged the four supervisor to let me have off time a leave of absence to go so in 1984 then I was free to go that summer and from May till August and she always says how many days it was and it was 11 weeks <laughs> By himself up there in the wilds of Alaska. He and Bill Anderson and one other. Yes. So was that right around Fairbanks, that area? Yeah. 